So Chris, just to, just to talk to me then. How, how long how long have we been working on JPX nine two one? Because you, you've got a backdrop as a club designer. You're no longer a club designer. You're now you're now a little bit. You've risen above that. You've got more of an overview of product now. Is that right? Uh, I don't know if that's exactly right, but it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's it. I'm in a slightly different role where I still work very closely with the club engineers in our R and D department. But you're right. You know, for the last you know call it fifteen years, I've been on the engineering side of things. And a lot of that saw the evolution of the JPX line, the 900, the 919. I was heavily involved in the development of those. The 921 is a product that I was involved in the development of just in a different manner, meaning I, was, I wasn't doing a lot of the CAD clicks. However, I was working very closely with the, uh, with the R&D team in terms of what the product needs to be, what the direction is going to be of it, what improvements we're looking to make. So it's interesting to look at this line from my point of view, because I'm looking at it from a slightly different view, you know, I, while I still feel like there's a little bit of ownership over each of the products, it's a lot less than there was before. But it's cool because, you know, every time you get a slightly different player's take or different engineer's take on a product too, you get something a little bit different. There are some things that I know from my side, I would have done a little bit different, but that doesn't mean they were right. So it's, it's cool because it's a little bit of a rethinking of the 921 or the JPEG line in terms of what it can be. So I'm excited to see everything that the 921 line turned out to be because it is different than the 919 line. Where, where are you right now, Chris? You're, you're in Atlanta, right? Is that, that's not a design suite behind you. That's just the, your little media room there? Yeah, so this is our little room. This was, if anyone who saw us at the PGA show over the last couple of years, these are some of the images we had in our, in our room there. Uh, I am in Atlanta, so this is where the U.S. Design Center is. is we have one in North Cross, Georgia. We've got another in Osaka, Japan. And really what we do is we work very closely together, you know, getting feedback from your team over in the UK, some guys in Australia, guys in Korea, guys in Canada, you name it from all across the world. But a, a lot of the key engineers behind the 921 product sit in this, in this office in Atlanta. Fred, I think you probably win most interesting backdrop. What, what, what have you been up to this afternoon? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in Sweden and uh, it's 70 degrees, it's absolutely gorgeous outside, and uh, uh, COVID is, we have, a, we have kind of managed it. It was, uh, it was bad in the beginning, but now we, I think one person dies, unfortunately, each day, but it's a lot lower. So, uh, yeah, I'm waiting this out back home in Sweden. I'm actually normally based in Atlanta, close to Chris, so I get to hang out with the boys over there quite a lot, and uh, it's a great team, you know. It's uh, fantastic. They know ex a lot about the clubs. Chris helped me out with my fitting. And uh, I'm super excited to hear more about the new irons. Where, where was your game pre-COVID? Were we on a good, good up curve before this hit? Yeah, actually, I just, I just got my new clubs um, and finished second in a mini tour event and then played great. And then obviously COVID happened when you're on a little bit of a streak that happens, obviously. And now uh, PJ Tour Latino America has been canceled this year. So no more of those tournaments. They just started like a mini series of events in the U.S. But as of right now, uh, I can't get into the country actually. So uh, uh, I'm staying here. <laughs> and Ian, so you, you, you're back and operational. Were you, were you ever shut down at all? Yeah, we were shut down for the best part of two and a half months, Dave. So... Yeah, we've been open for a couple of months. Um, golf has just been booming over here, as I'm sure it is back in the UK, with, with being one of the very few things that people can do. So, you know, we, obviously with the swell from being closed, we were very, very busy anyway. And then, you know, I think post-lockdown, we've, we've seen unprecedented requests for fits. We, we had about 500-person wait list when we reopened, and it's, wow. it's swollen up now to about an 800-person wait list. I've never seen anything like it in the golf industry, to be honest. Um, we were just about to, I literally was, I was hoping to do this, my end of it from our brand new location, which is about two miles from, from where I live. Um, but there's, we open tomorrow, so there's drills going off and guys are hanging stuff. And uh, it would have been a lot more interesting backdrop than, than, uh, than the home anyway. 
But um, yeah, it's, I mean, we're, I think we're super fortunate all to be in golf and, and be allowed to be, keep doing what we're doing. So Chris, I think that's, 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 go on, Fred. Just to add to that, I think Sweden has had like three million more rounds so far this year than last year. Yeah. So people can't Incredible, do anything else here. They can't go watch football or anything else. Uh, that's soccer for you, Chris. <laughs> and uh, so, so people play golf, you know, I, I teach a lot of lessons here in Sweden now and, you know, I had, I have a full book straight away. So, uh, in a lot of ways, COVID has been horrible, but for the golf industry, um, in some cases, at least a lot of new people have been introduced to the game and hopefully will continue to play from now on. Yeah. And it's, it's had a bit of an effect on this launch as well, isn't it, Chris? So. I know there's, there might be a few people out that have been waiting on clubs a little bit longer than normal. So just just explain a little bit of the backdrop of that for me. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, just to say that 2020 has been a strange year is just not even scratching the surface of it. But, you know, in general, you look at the golf season as very, very popular in March, April, May, starts to tail off around June. But because of what COVID did and because of the, the lack of play early in the year, the pent up demand that, and what came out of it as people have started playing and places have opened up, courses have opened up, bidders have opened up, like Ian was saying, it's unbelievable how the industry has rebounded because it's one of those safe activities you can do. So we've been running, we're traditionally in the States, we run at a two days turnaround in terms of our custom builds. We're running closer to a month because our backlog is so big. The orders that came in in June, July, August, it's ridiculous, like nothing we've ever seen before. So I know there's a lot of frustrated people who are still waiting on their new clubs, but it's all because the quantities that are being ordered are unbelievable. And with that being said, you know, we're, there's usually plenty of time as the golf industry starts to die down to have everything ready to go for launch, to start building up for the next launch. But because everything is so popular, the 921 launch is almost like, feels like it's been pushed around a little bit because of the demand for the 919 and the MP20 and everything that's happened for there. So to say we've been scrambling a little bit for the 921 launch might be an understatement. But I think we're in a very good place and everything's ready to go. So we're just now having to react to how we create the content and how we share our message. Because like everything, the message is different this year and how you share it and how you get it across is this year. Hence this call. Fred, you're not, you're not a JPEX guy. You're an MP guy, correct? Yes, I'm an MP20 in uh, the 99 to 600 and HMB and 5 to 2. Okay. So generally pretty traditional in your taste and what you like to look at? Yeah, absolutely. And I tried the JPX irons and they were fantastic. In the end, I kind of liked a little bigger head in the longer irons because, you know, long irons is difficult to hit and you need that extra launch. You know, people, in the tournaments I play, they love to tuck uh, pins and I don't hit necessarily too much kind of down and compress the golf ball. Uh, well, I do it kind of maybe too much for the JPX iron, and I needed that extra little launch uh, that I had in the HMB. So I'm interested to see if if it's similar to the uh, MP20 uh, series, where you can have like if a bigger model in the longer irons and have uh, uh, more of a blade in the shorter irons. Plus, golf pros are no, no different to the rest of us, right? Sometimes you choose the newest one, the shiniest one, and you had to join us as we were launching 20s. So. That could have something no, to do with it as well. No doubt. And definitely uh, my girlfriend, Hannah, she, she signed with uh, you guys at the same time. And she wanted them just because of the looks. But Chris managed to uh, tell her that she needed something else, actually, that was better for her. But, uh, yeah, it plays a big role. Of course it does. You got to like what you look down on, right? But we've got some stuff on the way to you, Fred. So you, you've got some stuff to be testing for us after this call, right? So I think, Chris, what, 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 what's Fred got on the way to test for us? I believe he's got uh, seven irons and everything and maybe a whole set of the tours. Uh, I, it's been a little bit since we're trying to scramble to get everything to him, but we've been getting all the specs together, getting everything built up, and then trying to navigate international shipping. So trying to get it over to you. So you'll have a lot of stuff to test coming up soon. So I look forward to seeing what you're going to do with that. Absolutely, Dan, yeah. 
I'm looking forward to it. I got the trackman ready, the studio is ready. I got uh, I got balls and everything. I'm just waiting for him, man. It's a, such nice. a tease. <laughs> <laughs> And Ian, you, you've, if you, you've, you've had some testing a little bit already. Have you had, you had clubs in hand yet? We, we did. Actually, last week we had, um, we had Canadian Olympian uh, Donovan Bailey, a gold medalist from the Atlanta Olympics uh, from the 100 mm -hmm. meters. He was in last week and we, we done a nice little fit. So it was 24 years to the day since he had won his gold medal in Atlanta. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so, I mean, I remember that very, very well, watching that back in the UK as a youngster. Um, obviously, Dave, we, you know, Linford Christ, Christie was, was our guy. I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah, I was rooting for Linford Christie. Yeah, we, we were. So, 92, he wins the Golden Barcelona. 90, uh, 96, he's, he's kind of come to the end of his career. Ends up getting disqualified, if you remember, from that final. It was, it was, uh, it was a crazy one. So, it took 45 minutes to complete the, the 100 metres that night. And I'll never forget Donovan Bailey wearing the Mizuno on the uh, on the you know on the That's chest, right. and That's and right. the whole Canadian uh, relay team were, were wearing Mizuno. So it was really nice to have him in, and, and he was he was pretty pumped to to be you know getting into sort of Mizuno product off the back of off the back of that. So we had a chance to see it in action last week. And is he a golfer? Has he yeah, got he is game? a golfer. I mean, he's he's just he's just a raw athlete. You can imagine what it's like somebody who's just just a, a pure pure driven athlete i mean he's he's not even you know probably accessing 50 percent of his power and he's swinging six iron at 94 miles an hour and he, he's, is that good you know is, is that speed mm -hmm. pretty good and you know he's hitting the thing 200 yards and we're trying to kind of explain some all the attributes about what we need to try and give him and and show him the new line he was really impressed uh, just a visual there chris so that's that's you filming a couple of weeks ago that's your home course right yeah, so uh, this is over at uh, Rivermont Golf Club. This is off the, off the back of number 11. It's a nice little drivable par four. So if you get scared, this is where you bail out into this downhill bunker shot. And yeah, we did some nice product filming there. You know, in years past, we've, myself and you, Dave, we've typically gone and met somewhere and done some filming on location. You've been there over my shoulder and we've been doing a lot working together. But obviously this year is a little bit different. So we actually, I think we did a lot of the product filming through FaceTime. Yeah, we so, were FaceTiming it. So, uh, so. But there, are, but there are prettier films. There are prettier films to come. That was the kind of point it's showing. This, don't worry. If you're yes. used to seeing Chris <laughs> in a beautiful location, hitting golf balls, it's coming. It's just a little <laughs> bit down the track. So we did want to hold all the information back. So this is kind of where the story started, right? Was the the smoking iron. Um, I just thought I just I just walk us through this because I always find it interesting to see people's reactions and feed off of that. So this was the first visual. So he the smoke and iron, hence forging just got a little bit hotter. The connotation is obviously hot metal makes forging chromoly, and I've, it's been really interesting watching the reactions to that, and hence the questions I've got written down that I've kind of pulled from social media from the last few days. But actually, one of the things that caught people's attention, Chris, was um, Bo Hogue out there on the PGA Tour. So. Mm -hmm. Was he the first guy to have a set of tools in play? He was. He was actually the very first guy to test them, uh, uh, test the final product and get a build up. And right away, it actually caught us a little bit off guard because we knew he had, we had delivered him his set, but we didn't know he was putting them in play until kind of actually after the tournament. We found out a couple weeks ago when he had shot a final round 63 to move into, I believe he finished T12 that week. Um, really good showing for Bo. Bo is a great young player, uh, fresh off the Corn Ferry Tour, having a tremendous rookie season. And what's funny is uh, Jeff Crawford, one of our, our guys who handles a lot of our social accounts, a lot of our marketing side, basically just reached out to Bo and said, hey, you know, great last round, great finish. And then he came back with, yeah, the new irons were awesome. So with that, it kind of led to, oh, wait, you're playing them already? So then we, it was the scramble of, can we get some pictures? Can we get it out? So yeah, this was the first leaked image because Bo put him into play right away. Uh, Ian, does that have any impact on people coming in that studio? Do you, do, does that, you know, a, a tour player with things in actions, tour players winning, do you see instant reaction to that or is it more of a slow burn? No, you do. You do. I mean, to be honest, the last... The last two weeks, especially on a Monday when we do our live Q&A, um, we have, have had a heavy, heavy amount of questions related to, to 921. And, and to, even before that, to be honest, because I think they knew there was something coming in the pipeline. 
So, you know, people are always asking us, should we wait? Have you seen it? Can you give us any little, you know, little, you know, ideas as to what's coming? So it definitely, it definitely does make an impact. And, uh, you know, we've definitely seen that. What did, what did you think to the paint job on those, uh, Fred? Does that, does that appeal to you? Blue paint film? Yeah. Yeah, no, the irons look great. And as soon as he posted that, I'm sure I received probably 80 DMs from people asking me about the clubs. And I was like, I have no idea what clubs those are. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was like, even now when I reshared it on my story, I got tons of questions. So people are super curious. I'm curious. I'm excited uh, to hear more about them. But yeah, I mean, yeah, Instagram blew up there for a second. And you have a lot of very loyal fans that, as soon as uh, something new comes out, people know it's good stuff and want to know more about it. So, so Chris, fill me in. Is that Bose paint job or did Mizuno have a hand in that? <laughs> That's actually Bose paint job. So, uh, nice. so I, I, I say that probably Kyle Hammond on our tour van, he probably put those together for him. <clears throat> and you'll, you'll notice a lot of our clubs that we have out on tour. We'll do a lot of, um, They'll, they just want to customize it. They're like a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of your customers, Ian, are the same way, where I know you guys do some stamping, ferals, funky yeah. stuff like that. You know, this was something a little bit different to make it a little bit more personal. So when you see the final product, which I don't think any images have leaked yet, which in this day and age is pretty incredible, considering there's a, I could think of about 20 or 30 heads that we've sent out to random people. So the fact that none have leaked yet is pretty awesome. But yeah, when you see the final, it's actually a lot more monochromatic than that. So the bright blue tour, the bright blue run bird, those aren't going to be there. The, obviously, he's got his initial stamp on the toe. Um, even the white paint fill on the sole, uh, these don't, don't have that. So this is a totally different look to it. So it's funny how some people immediately jump on to the cosmetic. And I'm reading some of these comments here, agreed a big step backwards. You haven't even seen the final product yet. So, Well, well I, I always find interesting. So I, I pulled from the left, actually came from a Mizuno feed from, um, I think it might have been the Mizuno Instagram account. And on the right is from Gulf WX. So a very pro Mizuno crowd and a, a more of a, and a different crowd, a very knowledgeable mm -hmm. crowd on the right. And it, you really got two camps on it. You know, just uh, is the blue feel necessary? Will it be in production models? Please say it will be on the production model. And <laughs> someone else, sad the Mizuno blue looks great. And then from WRX, I read um, a big step backwards. The strip of chrome is a big detractor. Other than the blue custom fake feel, <laughs> I reserve judgment. So it's amazing how polarizing that is, isn't it? Yeah. One thing that I think has cracked me up being on the product development side for years is the comments on the first image anybody sees of anything are 90% negative from Mizuno because our <laughs> clubs are always so beautiful that nobody wants you to mess with them. So it's funny. It's like the first image, it's like, oh my gosh, you took my work of art and you destroyed it. But I think we've got a pretty good track record of actually making some really nice looking irons. So it's funny how the first image to when you get down the line, actually people start seeing them in hand and you see some of the comparison pictures that it's going to shift 180 degrees. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I, th I think, I think really we're, le well we're, less se we're less sensitive than we used to be, aren't we, Chris, about negative comments? <laughs> yes. you know, that would have broken our hearts, wouldn't it, 15 years ago before <laughs> we realized how all this stuff works? <laughs> Yeah, the funny thing is that that's literally the opposite of what people will, will think once they see it, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. having, having seen it in, in person and in hand, it, it literally is the opposite to that. So you, you're absolutely right. They'll do a 180 very, very fast. Right. <laughs> so Chris, I want to do, just do some specifics. We're going to rattle through the tech and I've got some questions from people. But uh, the first one, I, I've put a picture up of the, the T20 there because wedges are very, people are very very specific about wedges, especially better players and what they look like and what they shouldn't look like. So I started off with something very classic there in the T20. And then we're gonna, we're gonna show people the ES20 wedge for, for the first time. So ES21. And yeah. Ooh. It's, all based, it's a based around where the, where, where, the, where the sweet spot sits in the face, right? Because you'll, you'll explain it much better than I will, but a, a traditional wedge, the look that we've become attached to and very fond of that very high, the high, you know, the long hose or the way, you know, the, the teardrop look, not always perfect for everybody's game in terms of where the sweet spot's based. Have I got that right? Yeah, it's funny. The, the story I like to tell a little bit to kind of, 
I don't know if it's the, to soften somebody into their first view of the ES21, but if you look at the look at how clubs have modernized over the over the last how for years, decades, you've seen drivers go from small little pieces of persimmon to massive chunks of titanium. You've seen irons get bigger, more forgiving. You've seen putters where, you know, 10 years ago, a better player had an answer style or a small blade putter. And now all of a sudden you look at the top players in the world and they're playing big, what at one point would be considered very ugly mallets. The wedge has been one of those clubs that the cosmetic and the look and what's been deemed beautiful on a wedge hasn't really changed, hasn't really evolved. And a lot of the things that people expect from a wedge, the performance, the look, they're actually detrimental to the design of the wedge and detrimental to where the sweet spot lives. I know this graphic says the sweet spot of a traditional wedge sits in the heel and that's very accurate. And what that means is when you hit a wedge in the middle of the score lines, it's actually a slight mishit. So ES21 was a totally rethinking of the wedge. It's not going to be for everybody, but that's okay because the technology itself and how it performs is actually going to speak to a lot of people. And I think a lot of people who are a little bit nervous about it at first are going to change their minds. You work with a lot of players on short game, Fred, and you work with a lot of good players on short game. Not every single low handicap golfer is super precise with their wedges. I mean, no, hey, not on. even, yeah, not even tour players. Uh, what I like, I, I didn't even know we we're going to talk about wedges. So I'm super excited right now. Uh, <laughs> Chris, let me ask, so this, is the CG higher? Is that what, what it is? or it, It's not only higher, but it's also in the exact geometric center of the face, of the score lines, okay. which is okay. very different. So you can actually see on this image right here, the, um, the center of gravity icon on there. That actually shows... That's exactly where the center of gravity is. This wedge will balance on that point right there. It'll balance right on the center of the score lines. Yeah, I love that because here's the deal, you know, the best players in the world, they have a shallow attack angle. They're able to hit it lower on the face to make sure that they don't hit it above the CG. The amateur golfer uh, are going to tend to be a lot steeper and hit it more like, higher on the club face, which is going to kill the spin uh, the distance control and everything. So if you build a wedge that allows a player to be more consistent, even though they might be a little steeper, uh, that's fantastic. And no one hits their wedge shots on the heel. You know, even good players more out on the toe, further out on the golf club. So uh, I love the sound of this. I, I didn't even know it was coming. I'm pumped <laughs> to try these. You better send me some of these quick. <laughs> For sure. So, but, so looks are important, Chris. So this is just the tech, the tech blurb, which everybody will see out there. They don't need the video for that. But two pieces, again, we've got the normal bore on face, grain flow forged. And you can see on the back piece, the reason to put that in is to show all that toe weight in, which is what's dragged the center of gravity back to, sorry, the sweet spot out to the center. Is that right? That's right. I'm actually holding, I've got a, a, these exact pieces right here, the face and the neck. The face part is very traditional. The size is ever so slightly larger than a T-series, but it's by no means a big wedge. But what's crazy is what we did geometrically with the back part. We took all of the mass out of the heel and shoved it all high and towards the toe. So the center of gravity moved literally 10 millimeters, which when you're talking about moving a center of gravity on a golf club, it's not uncommon to hear movements of half a millimeter, three quarters of a millimeter. We moved it 10 millimeters from where it was in the T20, completely from the heel side to the exact geometric center. So a huge movement. And I know there's some other companies trying to do some sorts of movement, but I've never seen anything move nearly like this. But it's, not, it's, not a high, it's not a high handicap wedge. It's not a game, imp game improvement. It's a strange term anyway. Kind of gets yeah. banded around a little bit, doesn't it? But in your mind, when you're setting out to develop this wedge and this kind of technology, you're still, you're still thinking of the better play. You're not thinking of 18, 24 handicap as you're being your target. You're looking at better player looking for more consistent spin. That's exactly right. And Fred said it perfect where, you know, the better player has found a way to manipulate their angle of attack to ensure hitting below the sweet spot. And when you hit below the sweet spot on a wedge, that's when you get more bite. That's when you get a lower launch and you get more spin out of it. What, by, what we did by moving the center of gravity and by raising the center of gravity is put more of the head 
below the sweet spot. So for any player, whether you're a high handicap or a low handicap, you're going to generate more spin with it. So that was the whole idea behind the development. And there's there's different versions of it. There's a wide sole, there's a narrow sole, there's some that some that will probably speak to a higher handicap, but some that definitely will speak to a lower handicap. So it's just a different rethinking of how Mizuno develops a wedge, aside from just spitting out the S series or the R series that someone probably expected from us. There's there's the video it. just showing how it balances on the center thread. Yeah, no, I love that. And uh, so there are going to be different grind options too. You said sole options. So there going to be different bounce options or how does that look? That's right. Yeah. So there's uh, different sole width options and different grind options as well. So there's a wide sole and a standard sole. Um, and then both of those are available in a number of different lofts and bounces. So tons of different options for all different player types. And must do fit Sorry, Karen. For is it just the black finish or are there going to be different finishes too? It's just the black finish. This is Love something it. different. Yeah, we didn't do anything about the black here. <laughs> no, man. Everyone wants a black club. Come on. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> so something that works in the studio, Ian? You must do a lot of wedge fittings now. That's a, it's a kind of a, a growing part of your business, I would guess. Yeah, it really is. And, and I think we're very, maybe very fortunate in that when it comes down to wedge fits for us, I mean, we're, we're talking about the visuals and, and obviously this might be a little bit different when people see it on the shelf. I don't really feel like that is, is as applicable to us because we're governed by performance. So we're going to get in the studio. We're going to see how tight those launch and spin numbers are. We're going to see how, how we can talk to the CG and the strike and use our GC quad to kind of, you know, show how we're manipulating that strike lower than the CG to control launch and spin. And, and this is purely talking to tech. And that's what we're we were governed by data in there and people are coming to us for that. So um, this is exciting for, for me because this is, this is just uh, uh, pushing the boundaries, you know, completely on anything we've ever seen. Are people more open-minded now, do you think, Ian, especially better yeah. players? Yeah, they are. They are. You, you, I mean, you, you know, we're talking on the timeline of the evolution of product design, you know, the things we've seen and accepted in the last 10 years has been quite incredible. So um, I think when, when people see this, they, they may take a look at the back and go, that's different from Mizuno. And then they're going to flip it around and go, well, that's not different from Mizuno. That looks like a Mizuno. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, S18 for us was massive. I mean, that was an unbelievably popular wedge for us. So, you know, the, the kind of mid-size profile of the wedge head uh, is something that our customers loved. And when you attach all the tech that's involved with this one, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see how it performs. So if I showed you at that angle first, Fred, hopefully you wouldn't have guessed what was coming. <laughs> no, I mean, the, I'm, I'm pumped, man. I think I've always been kind of looking, you, need, you know, people and brands have been doing the high toe wedge, which looks horrendous, but it kind of, they're trying to do the same thing, you know, to get the CG higher, more out on the toe. And if you come up with a different approach to it, that still looks, you know, like a Misuno, that would be sweet. So we're getting lots of questions on specs, Chris. So that's, that's pretty much it, isn't it, for everybody that's been asking. I've had fewer yeah. questions on ES21 because we haven't really put that out there yet. So um, I think we'll probably have to follow up on that one. But anything you want to pick out for people there? Well, what's going to be fun about this is, you know, Mizuno, for the most part, when we present products, good and bad, a lot of people kind of know what's coming. And as we've presented this product, and because the, you know, the general world hasn't seen this yet, nobody's expected this from us. So this is something different. We are gonna get a lot of interest from this. In terms of spec wise, uh, nothing too crazy. You can see some wide sole and traditional sole versions from 54 degrees all the way up to 60 degrees available like you would typically would see from Mizuno where you can bend it to hit any of your specs. And one thing I know Fred pointed out, the, the blacked out cosmetic, you can see it's a very blacked out design, comes with a blacked out shaft, blacked out grip, really cool, different from us, but a great compliment that does something different in our line than anything else. Uh, but what, what, why only start at 54 though, Chris? That's gonna puzzle some people. Yeah, a lot of the, the design behind this was more designed for those partial shots. You know, you, you think of the traditional pitching wedge, gap wedge, or almost more of, full swing clubs for a lot of people. When you're talking extreme center of gravities, then that's gonna have a, have a different effect when you're making full strikes at it. You know, 
Um, I think it was Fred talked about your angle of attack, what that's going to do in terms of creating different spin. When you're creating a full swing strike with a gap wedge, traditionally that's a pretty descending blow. So it's not really what this club is designed for. This is more designed for those partial shots, which is why it lives in that 54 to 60, those higher lofted options. So you're open to giving it a go, Fred? No doubt. No, I'm excited. No, you know, uh, I always, always want to try new stuff to make it easier to lower my launch and control the distance because that's what it's really all about. You know, even in all the lessons that I give here in Sweden, short game, people come all over Sweden to work with me now. Uh, the biggest thing I see with people that struggle with distance control is obviously strike, but also to control their launch. You know, it's that, you know, if you're around the greens and you want to hit a specific part of the green, it's a lot easier to hit it with a low chip than trying to hit it with a flop shot. So controlling the launch, the best players launch it at under 30 degrees, which is for an amateur, it's an amateur probably launched it twice that. So you got to be able to get that penetrating flight to be able to control your distance. So this is, this could be huge. If you can help amateurs to lower the launch and be more consistent, it's, uh, it's going to be fantastic. Biggest advantage overall, Chris? Consistent spin, or what would you what would you say? I'd say was... consi yeah, consistency and predictability of launch. And I know Ian talks a lot about data drives everything. And if you can be more consistent from shot to shot with that data, you're going to get better performance, particularly on a wedge where you're trying to dial in specific shots. Okay, so that brings us on to the meet. So we've had no questions on that one yet because it hasn't been out there. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of questions on nine two one. <laughs> So this was the film that's already been out and I've been, I've been sort of tracking it and seeing the comments on that and you guys have all posted as well. Slightly different look for Mizuno in terms of a communication, but in terms of a product, very recognizably Mizuno, Chris. Especially yeah, in Forge. It, yeah, I mean, it, it has all those features of a Mizuno. It's very clean, it's traditional looking, even though it lives in the JPX line. You've seen JPX get very cleaned up lately and get very... Uh, very smart looking and very nice and, and aesthetically pleasing. But at the same time, the video is a little bit bolder than you'd expect from us. More flashing lights, loud noises, big bangs, like all sorts of things. Because this golf club, even though it looks very traditional, it does some non-traditional things from its construction. So the main question we get is, what's different? Are they better? Will I see a difference? Do, you know, what, why would I ever need to upgrade from 919s? So of all the products that are coming in this sequence, would you say this is the one that's developed the most from the previous generation? For sure. I mean, every, every product within the 921 line has improved, but I'd say the 921 Forge has made the biggest jump in, biggest jump in performance. A lot of that comes with this. It's our first ever full body Forge chromoly iron. So I say full body because we, uh, if you look at like the, uh, the HMB iron, it's a forged face and neck. And I say full, full body forged because the chromoly material is similar to what's lived in our hot metal, which has been our distance iron for the last number of years. So to be able to fully forge a one piece chromoly iron, you're able to get the benefits and the ball speed from that stronger material to get more, uh, more power, more uh, distance generating features to the ball. This is a great view of it. The geometry we're able to get to forging it and then doing what we call our back milling process where we actually go in through the sole and make it uh, parallel to the face, ultra thin. We're able to go half millimeter thinner than we've ever gone before on a forging here. And a half millimeter doesn't sound like a lot, but in terms of face thickness, that is a massive amount in terms of creating not just a higher COR or better ball speed, but better ball speed across the entire face. So really, in simplest terms, the best of the, almost like the best of both, right? Very much what you had in the hot metal where great ball speeds, but then mm -hmm. from the forging, but you've tried to retain some of the size characteristics, some of the feel characteristics, some of the, the look of the product. You've, if you, you haven't changed that to go to the larger side. So people are seeing Cromoly and wondering if we've gone bigger. Is that, is that true? What's funny is we've actually gone smaller. And that's what I think is really going to strike some people about this club. Uh, it is not only better performing, but it is less offset. It's thinner top line. It's smaller heel to toe. So this is one of those clubs that, you know, as soon as people say this club goes farther, this club is hotter, 
the instant thing that comes to the better player's mind is it probably got bigger, it probably got stronger, probably did all these things. When Mizuno really hits its stride and when Mizuno does a product well, is when we make it smaller. We need to get more performance out of a smaller package. So this is slightly stronger because we were able to save so much weight by going so much thinner with the chromoly material that the center of gravity and the moment of inertia are increased tremendously. So it's more forgiving in a smaller package and higher launching. So you're able to go slightly stronger with a hotter face as well. So the distance you'll see with this compared to the 919 Forge, it's gonna be significantly longer. Ian, how, how does that club look to you? Is that, is that the sort of thing that might appeal? Yeah, that, I mean, that's gonna tick. It's going to tick the boxes. I mean, when people walk into the bay and, and talk to us about when we have that initial sort of discovery conversation, what would you like to play? What have you done some window shopping and had your eye on? They always pick out the, the, the good looking clubs. And then you maybe see them hit a few and you go, uh, you might need something a little bit more forgiving than that. And that's a difficult conversation because you take them away from what they want to play. And, you know, hearing the, the design concept behind this, how it effectively plays like a larger club in a really pleasing package it is going to be fantastic. A little bit thinned uh, out face for a little bit more face contribution to get that launch up. And something we're talking a lot about in the Bay right now is when people are getting so caught up in spin rates. So we, we've got a video coming very, very soon on the, the ball stopping via land angle versus spin. So is it, is it, you know, if a ball has more spin but a lower launch angle, what does it do versus a ball that has higher launch and, and more ball speed with less spin? What does it do? And I think people are going to be shocked to see the result of what actually stops a golf ball. Um, and just talking about all this sort of tech, I mean, people are going to fall in love with this. The, the, the looking at that profile there and how little offset and how the size of the head, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Fred, can you, I mean, they often say you should play the most forgiving thing you can bear to look at. <laughs> Can you, is, is that something is it within your kind of window possibility or is that still a little bit on the on the larger side for you? Um, no, I mean, listen, I play whatever makes me play better. I don't care. I care how it looks. That's that's a lie. I don't care. Yeah, of course lie. I care how it looks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I like about this, normally when you see a head like that, you the first thing you think is, oh, this is going to have a ton of offset. You know, this is going to be one of those, you know, anti you know slice kind of irons and so on but that looks gorgeous there it looks like a straight club face uh, i love the fact that you mentioned that it's smaller because better players tend to like to look down at something that's just a little bit thinner a little bit smaller so uh no i mean initially it looks great looks fantastic lots of questions on boron versus chromoly as well chris i think mm -hmm. boron was always a little bit misunderstood but mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of process the normal grain flow forge process still, still in Hiroshima, Japan, still at the Chiro plant, correct? Correct. And yeah, that's boron was such a funny animal because what it did is still a 1025 material. Um, a lot of people said that the boron didn't feel good. And a lot of that is based off of the geometry of what was dictating that, not the material itself. We did a couple things with the chromoly 4120 that we're using in this. First, we had to develop a whole new forging you know, process. You can't just take a new material and a new billet and put it in the same mold and expect to get the same golf club because different materials flow at different rates. They form in different ways. So this actually required a third set of molds, which is totally different than anything we've done in the forging world. On, in terms of the feel, it is a stronger material, but what we did geometrically and acoustically, this actually feels even softer than our previous versions. One thing that you'll notice, I know on the previous slide, you should have the vision, the vision from behind. The 919 and the 900 Forge had uh, visible cuts through the sole side. This one, while it still has that thin face area, a lot of it's more internal and covered up. So you don't see that geometrically and acoustically that's actually going to make the club more reinforced and it's going to make it feel even softer so it yes we did change materials to a 1025 uh boron material but we also are sorry from a 1025 boron material to a uh, uh 4120 chromoly but we made it feel even better even though the club got hotter some great looking pictures there chris so you see i i know knowing yourself you'll be most proud of how the club looks Mm. <laughs> in terms of once you've packed all that technology in, the, the fear is that it ends up looking like something that you personally wouldn't want to play. 
And I know this is probably in your window of things that you would now look at and play. It's totally true. You know, especially I love the technology and everything behind the Forge model we've had for the last number of generations. The 850 Forge, which was the first time we went really chromed out, it was a beautiful looking club from behind. But there was something at a dress where it was just a little bit large. The, the scoring irons in particular were a little bit too big. When you get to these, when you see the 921 Forge, man, did they slim down, particularly in the scoring irons. And yeah, this is something that a player who would not have considered this one, who always considered themselves a JPX tour guy, actually might find themselves being swayed a little bit. And the big question is, will I notice the difference? How far uh, back would you have to go through through the Mizuno line uh, chronologically before you, get, you go, you will see the difference? I, I mean, I don't think you have to go far back at all. This is going to be a softer feeling, better performing version of even last generation. And you can't always say that to say that there's a big jump from generation to generation. For each club, that might not always be the case. For this one, it's absolutely the case. So there's all our specs there. Everything you would expect to see and anything jump out at you there? No, not at all. I mean, one of the things, just touching on the, the fit we done with Donovan last week, um, maybe some people are, are wondering with the change in material and um, will it feel differently? Does, is the, the club more adjustable, less adjustable? Is that part of, you know, the, the issue? Donovan being a sprinter gets so much of his force vertically. So when he explodes through the golf ball, everything is, is a lot of kind of lift and, and, you know, sort of, you know, hip extension and he really stands up in the shot. So, he, he tended to kind of tilt the face a little bit to the right. So I had to go to the loft line machine and really move the clubs upright for him. And, and it, was, it was remarkable how soft they were and how easy we were able to get um, three, four degrees upright for him to be able to sort of tilt that face back on track uh, so he could hit it a little bit straighter. So um, definitely nothing in terms of the specs, though, that stands out um, for us there. Not very modern. So Ian and Fred, I know both you guys have got pretty hectic schedules today. I know there's some teaching and you've got fittings to do. Can you, can you hang with us for another 10, 15 minutes or have either of you got to jump to your next, next phase? I'm good. I'm good too. All good. Brilliant. Okay, wonderful. Because I, I know the next one is, has a little bit of conversation around it. Is it Fred, any, anything you want to add on to that for, the Forge conversation? No, I mean, I'm just happy that you explained what was a chronology what it was. So it's a different material. <laughs> I don't know. Chronology. Chron 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 yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I was sitting quiet there until you told me so I didn't have to sound stupid. No, but uh, <laughs> uh, so, so it's a completely different material in the iron. It's, right? That's it's, as long as I'm getting it. It's totally different than what we've used in that iron in the past. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a grade of material similar to what we've been using in our hot metal iron. Fantastic. All right. I'm, I'm so, on yeah, So two, two generations as the hot metal, and this is the first time it's come into the forged. Correct. But you're guaranteeing people aren't going to feel a harder material. It's not going to be clickier. You're going to get that kind of Mizuno feel cut out of it, Chris. Well, that's, that's just it. The, the player's distance category and the type of clubs that this is going to be compared against, there's so many clubs that say forged on the market that are designed for the better player, but to, for the better player to hit it longer. So that when you write forged on a golf club, there's an expectation of feel that goes along with that. And it's so amazing how forge has been used so loosely over the last number of years that a lot of times forgings now don't feel great. Our forgings and what we've done with them, we're not, we're not falling for that. So if you look at ours and how they feel versus a lot of other things in that market, the feel is unreal. It's still very, very Mizuno. So, so for a club to be stamped with forged, there's no industry test to say this is forged, this is not forged, correct? It can be interpreted slightly differently. That's right. I mean, basically, it, it could be anything from starting with a billet and making a golf club to just forging the face and neck to just forging the back part to literally casting a club and then pressing the score lines in or pressing the back. There's really no hard definitions in terms of what makes a club forged. For Mizuno, you, when you look at ours, you see Grain Flow Forge and Grain Flow Forge HD on all of our golf clubs. What that Grain Flow means is that we're actually putting continuous grains 
from mm -hmm. the face up the hosel. So you get long continuous vibration. So that's where we draw the line. We draw the line in a very different place than anybody else because a lot of those face insert forged irons, sure, they'll be easier for Ian to, build, to bend when he's doing a custom fitting, but the amount of feedback that comes from that face impact up the hosel for that long vibration, it's not gonna be there. And just to put the rumor to bed, Chris, we're still forging, Mizuna still forges its irons at Hiroshima. We haven't moved anywhere else, we're still there because oh. I know that one rattles around, doesn't it, sometimes? This is always, and what's cool is by working with Hiroshima, by working with Chuo, that's something that we've been developing this chromoly forging for a number of years. So it's, a, it's really, it's a partnership there where we're working to not only make our forgings better, but to improve the world of what's possible from a forging. So yes, all from the exact same place that you get your MP20 muscle back, everything. I think what's interesting is, is when we talk about all these terms that have been used by Mizuno for a long, long time, continuous you know, grains and, and sort of the, the press forging process. I think as, as other companies try and up their game, they start to use a lot of the same terms. So it just shows how long Mizuno have been doing those things and how important that has been to them from a feedback standpoint acoustically and, and through the hands. And, and um, you know, I'm seeing some, some new products come into the market, you know, in the next few months. And, and there's, there's a lot of buzz terms, if you want to call them that, that, that are Mizuno terms to me, because I've heard them from you guys for such a long time and, and they're starting to use the same, the same thing. So in my sense, that's them trying to catch up with where Mizuno have been with forged irons for the longest time. That must be nice there, Chris. And I love hearing that. You're, you're exactly right. So, I mean, obviously, I haven't seen everything you've seen, Ian, but it's, it's funny when you read people describing their forging processes and acting like, hey, now our forgings have this, or now we're doing this to our forgings. These are things that we've done for years and years and years and things that we've modernized and, and are doing that. That's a given when we do a forging. So it's amazing how, how much some people will brag about little things that we just take for granted because we are forging experts. So just quickly moving on then to the, to the tour model, the one that really kind of defined the JPX line from the start. So Fred, there are certain names that you can't say here. So just mm -hmm. give you a quick warning on that one. But it's, it's, fair, it's fair to say it's had a good following on tour and it's had some high profile usage. So this has been yeah. an interesting one to see it evolve as well, Chris, that you've got the very heavy toe weight in there in the, um, the, the 919, slightly less so in the 900. How have you seen the world of tour divided into JPX players and MP players? Because that's always a confusing one for people. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, this is a project that the JPX tour model is one that's very, very near and dear to me because I, I worked on both of these projects and they were something that we had a vision of how can we evolve from being just the Mizuno muscle back company and evolve JPX from there. And a lot of that comes from looking at what modern younger players are using on tour. If you look at an MP golf club, they are very traditionally weighted. They not only look traditionally from behind, but the sweet spot, the workability, the CG, the shaft axis, if you want to get into like the actual, uh, the physics measurements of them, there, there's characteristics of an MP that are different than a lot of what our competitors do and a lot of what JPX Tour does as well. So what you've seen a lot from the tour is a lot of the younger, faster swinging players, not necessarily the the artists out there, the guys who are working the ball from left to right, where every shot's something that's been envisioned. This is a lot more gone into the guys who are the faster swing speed, they hit the straight shot, they want it to go the same place every time, but they still demand that feel. And that's where some of that toe weighting and the an extreme uh, stability frame weighting has come from with the JPX Tour. So from the 900 to the 919, we saw the weighting get even more extreme out towards the toe. And then what's great is we've got a new stable of players to speak to in terms of what could this club do better? And that's how we go on, go about developing the next version of this. So there we go. So that looks slightly different to the ones we saw on social media the other week. A little yes. bit cleaner, Fred. Yeah, no, it's, it looks great. It's definitely a little bit, yeah, it looks a little bit smaller in the back there. So yeah, definitely. And dead straight face, no offset. Love it. 
Um, what you expect to see, Ian, in a, in a JPX, or is it gonna? Is it kind of leaned a little bit into the world of MP there? Um, yeah, it just it just looks like again you're you're getting the same profile, the same package looking down on it, but again looking at the back design there, and, and so you're being offered more forgiveness um, than sort of ever before. So again, speaking to that JPX player, that I, I can completely relate to what Chris is talking about there with the, those players who are coming. They just they swing so hard, they don't really want to work the ball as much. It's it's a much different way of playing the game than the shot makers would play it. And, and I can completely see the differentiation between those lines, the MP player who's maybe working it a little bit and, and the JPX player who's, you know, you know quote unquote, the athlete who's, who's going to really just swing with some speed. So um, I think it's going to really speak to that player. So this is just demonstrating the change in that toe weighting, Chris. So essentially just kind of nudging it maybe halfway between where the 919 was and where the 900 was? That's right. So one of the big differentiators, I and you know, Ian and I are both talking about workability versus stability. Uh, typically you've seen the JPX side be much more stable. The JPX Tour with that toe weight, it's a club where the club is a little bit more in control versus the player in more control when you have a shorter CG to shaft axis. So the toe weighting of the JPX 919 Tour was pretty extreme. There was a lot of mass out towards the toe, which really let the club dictate where the ball was going more so. One of the things of feedback we got was if I could get the same level of forgiveness, but add a little bit more workability, then that might be a good uh, upgrade to the JPX Tour. And that's where this is. So we actually dialed the toe weight back ever so slightly. So it's still, uh, still more toe weighted than an MP. So it's still more stable than an MP. But at the same time, there's a little bit more workability built into it than the previous version. And one thing I always like to point out about it, I'm not sure what the next slide you have is. I'm hoping it's uh, not that one, but that's okay. No, there's um, it, this one right here. The, when I look at those two clubs from behind, the 919 and the 921 from behind, the first thing in I, my mind that I recognized was it looks like the cavity grew on the tour. Mm -hmm. While it grew in terms of the surface area from the back, the cavity actually shrank in terms of the depth of it. So the club actually got thicker behind impact. So while it looks like a larger cavity, it's actually a smaller, shallower cavity, which ultimately is going to lead to an even softer feel. So, you know, the, with the tour player, feel, forgiveness, workability, looks, sleekness, those are all the, those are all the buzz terms that you want to hear. This club feels phenomenal, and it feels even better than the previous version. And that's a very complicated slide to make that point. Correct. Yes, this is showing actual <laughs> pit test data where we're we're uh, analyzing uh, the different modes of vibration and really dialing in the different modes. Of, and this is just the science behind. Feel isn't just a matter of where does it land when you make a club. We're engineering the feel into the golf club, and that's what it looks. The final products. So again, a lot, lot lot more monochromatic, but just just a, a more grown up looking club, Chris. Absolutely. So the 919 Tour, I think, is a beautiful club. It looked very mean, like in terms of hard, how hard and aggressive the lines were. This is a slightly softer version of that, which actually speaks a little bit to the feel and everything about it. It still looks JPX, but it's grown up a little bit. It's a very, you know, I love the monochromatic, the, the satin, white satin finish looks beautiful. And there's this little accent across the center. It just gives it a different life and different look to it. I just want to take you back a few, because actually this is important as well, isn't it? So this is the, diff people talk about the difference. So there's a difference. So I think the, the picture on the left says it best, which is the sole width. Yeah, so the sole width got slightly narrower on the scoring irons and slightly wider on the long irons. And what that speaks to is more versatility on the scoring irons and a little bit easier to launch in the longer irons. That being said, I know one of the common questions is what we did to loft and we didn't do anything to loft. So don't worry, we didn't go strong, we didn't do anything funky. But there's also then, you get a lot of questions, as you've kind of engineered almost a mixed set or a very heavy flow within the set. One of the questions we get a lot of is, are these designed to be mixed and matched the same way the MPs are? Or do you look at JPX as each model being its own kind of animal? Yes and no. Obviously we're trying to design the best set we can in terms of we want the three iron or the four iron to speak to the five, six, seven. But at the same time, 
we do recognize that not not a lot of players play these in the longer <clears throat> iron. So we do make sure that they can be combined with the with the forged in the in the long iron side. And there's our specs missing a three iron, which will be a surprise to a lot of people. But on tour, Chris, how many three irons have we made in the last year? Yeah, this is the funny stat is I know we're going to get screamed at. The, the, the two places we get screamed at are one, a left-handed person gets really <laughs> mad at us a lot of times. And the, the second is when we don't offer a one iron or a two iron or in something. The JPX Tour has been really funny because if you look here, there's not even a three iron in it. The previous 900 and 919 Tour, we offered three through Pitching Wedge. Most popular clubs we've had on Tour in the last four years and in, the, in those four years, we've built a total of zero three irons for tour players. So it's so <laughs> funny how many players will say, well, I need that three iron. But the best players in the world know that there are better options. And I'm sure from the fitting side, Ian, I'm sure you see that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we have the odd set that will come in with the three iron, but they, they sit on the, the shelf on – in the inventory room and, and kind of it's a, just a problem at the end of the year trying to kind of you know get rid of them or sell them on or do whatever we do with them no one's buying three irons that are part of the set anymore really right um you're buying a, a specialty club a utility club for that three iron are we partly guilty for that chris by the loss changing over the years has that kind of changed the game a little bit yeah the end is, the industry has more or less killed a three iron by strengthening lofts everywhere but at the same time, if you look at these, these are very traditionally lofted compared to the, the world. So even then, we're at a 21 degree, which would be, if we were to make a three iron, it would be 20 degrees. That's got a four or a five on it. It's coming from some of the other companies. But yeah, 21 degrees at a one piece grain flow forge, shallow cavity design, the center of gravity depth and height aren't going to justify that because the number of players that could launch that golf club and as ian was talking about get proper landing characteristics it's virtually nobody fred does that does that resonate do, do people need to look at the tour sometimes and, and swallow their ego somewhat i mean obviously you know if the best players in the world feel like they can't uh get the appropriate value or numbers with a set three iron then Maybe you shouldn't, you know, you just got to get yourself a HMB, man. MP20 HMB. I love mine. I got my three and two. And if you want one to, to hit cool stingers for the gram, you get the two iron and you, you know, you get your likes. But yeah, no, I mean, uh, of course, you got to look at, you know, if, if uh, some of the best tour players in the world feel like uh, a regular three iron is too difficult, then maybe you should consider that it might apply to you too, for sure. Ian, have we got, have we got the lefty combo set right? Look at those beauties. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Matty Boy will be delighted to see these. <laughs> Chris, what was you thinking yeah. on how you split the sets and what, why have you gone for a, a tall forged combo rather than straight forged? Yeah, so if you look at Mizuno, how we've traditionally offered left-handed models, it's been a lot of what are we going to sell the most of? It's been strictly a business decision of do, do the sales numbers justify the molds? Sometimes we want to break that, even though we would have sold more if we did a 100% set of forged irons, the JPEX 921 forged. One of the things we've done is we've, we've starved the left-handed player of this tour model ever since it's come out. They've never had it available to them. So it's always been frustrating coming up and talking to uh, to Ian and Matt up there because <laughs> Matt's doing so much hitting. And I, I love to talk about the tour, but he, I don't have one for him to hit. So, um, <laughs> so one of the things we really tried to do was analyze what combo sets are being made and where can we put together the most ideal set for the, for the highest majority of players. And with the JPX tour, we wanted to offer that to the left-handed player. And I mean, through tens of thousands of custom orders, we see this combo set as a really ideal place to make that break between the four and the five and then the six down and the tour. And it would make a pretty good right-hand combo set as well, correct? That's the funny <laughs> thing is, well, specs are so specs are so goofy because we talked about a few minutes ago with lofts being all over the place. 
it's become a six or seven iron launch launch monitor battle like who can hit their six or seven iron the longest and based off of that you see some weird things happening in lofts where you see big spreads on the short iron side and then compression on the long iron side by building this combo set as a left-handed obviously they have their own molds because they're left-handed we can put the lofts anywhere we want because we're not too concerned about the guy playing the jpx tour combining that or comparing that against a game improvement high cor or seven iron so we wanted to make this the best ideal set we could make and if you look from four iron five iron six iron seven iron down to wedge exactly four degrees between everything exactly half an inch between everything ideally this is like the perfect combo set you could order your right-handed version of it in these lofts but it would take calling out those lofts i need the sel lofts because in general the four and the five are different lofts than the six and the seven of these tours so it's arguably the best engineered set we have did you get enough good left-handed players in to justify this you wouldn't believe it, Dave. I mean, when I first moved here in 2011 and I saw the amount of left-handed golfers coming through the door, I mean, I think I would maybe do five to ten lefty fits a year back home. Yeah. And then we've had, we've had days in the shop where we've had all three bays going with left-handers and a left-handed putter fit going on at the same time. Um, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Hockey's got a lot to answer for up here. So, same in Sweden, right, Fred? Yeah, there are a lot of hockey players playing golf here too. So yeah, they're definitely more lefties here and obviously in, in Canada compared to uh, the US, I would say, no doubt. Yeah, yeah you've, you've got a few things in common there, near Canada and Sweden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to fire through the, the Kromoli story a little bit more quickly because I want to get to the final point, which is where all these sets fit together. And that's where a lot of people's questions are. The simplest version is, this is our third generation of Cromoly, Chris, in the hot metal lines. This time round, we're launching both the Hot Metal and the Hot Metal Pro together, which has implications on the sizes of the clubs, where they, where they fit together. Third generation of material, you generally get, that's where you see the greater performance gains historically? That's exactly right. I mean, we went from the engineering side, from the manufacturing side, obviously those two things have to work hand in hand when developing a golf club. When we are creating a very high COR iron, where you're trying to maximize and optimize every bit of it, the engineering side will say, let's go thinner, 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 where the manufacturing side will say, well, the yield will be this, there'll be breakage, there'll be this. So, so there's this give and take between the manufacturing and what's makeable versus what's designable. So the first generation of a chromoly material or first generation of any new material, there's a little bit of a handcuff put on you because in the long run, you don't know exactly the mass producibility and the long-term effects of what this material change will be. So you have to be a somewhat conservative on the design. As you go into year two or the next generation, you understand some things better and you can get more aggressive. Into year three, we know every lever we can pull. We're now experts at designing with this material. So we know where we can go thinner, where we can go thicker, and where we can actually like really push some limits that we hadn't pushed before. If you look at, um, and we'll show some slides later on that, some of the limits that we pushed on this to get even more ball speed out of this, because even though it's using the same material, it's more ball speed because of what we know we can do with this material. And to true kind of Mizuno fashion, we've done everything we can to make these clubs look like really, really nice golf clubs. You happy yeah. with how they look, Chris, how they've turned out? Uh, they turned out so nice. I mean, it's it's so funny when you look at our JPEX line, how much it has evolved and how much it's, I've used the phrase earlier, Dave, grown up. They've become very sophisticated. This is the Hot Metal. I believe the next slide is probably the Hot Metal Pro. And you can see two very just beautiful looking clubs from behind. If you look over the left side of that Hot Metal Pro, this is a distance iron with very little offset. Mm -hmm. It speaks to a lot of good players, but you know, the technologies between these two clubs, they're the exact same set of technologies. It's just two different packages. So one's a little bit larger, one's a little bit smaller. One's more offset, one's less. One's thicker, thicker sold, thicker top line, one's thinner, thinner, thinner. So what we've been able to do with these is fantastic. Did you, did you like the look of those? Sorry, just to put you in your track set, Fred. Yeah, look, no. Look, looks wise. Yeah, looks wise, it's great. I like that uh, 
you know, if you have the tour combo with the pro combo, I'm guessing, Chris, that's something I would play, right? If I want a little bit more help in the long irons. Yeah. What's been funny is when we developed the first 919 tour, yeah. it's, it's designed to be a distance golf club. What's been amazing is the amount of tour acceptance that the pro model has gotten. So the 919 pro, I, in any given week, there's probably a half dozen or more in bags of tour players because they still look the part and because the offset is so thin, these are great long irons to go on top of some, some forge and some better player sets. Love it. And this, is, this just shows what's behind the, behind the chrome, behind the skin, Chris. This is the, the new face design. That's right. So, you know, I talk about being able to push limits even farther. So you can see actually 0.2 millimeters thinner across the center. So we're able to get thinner, which is a better ball speed, but also able to optimize the ball speed across more of the face so that you don't have that drop off. The last thing you want is for a center strike to go a mile and then you slightly miss it up on the toe and then all of a sudden the ball speed drops off dramatically. So the chromalis allowed us to really dial in that, that ball speed across the face. And this is a clever slide just showing you how the, the, the sole of the club being a little bit thinner and the, the whole thing kind of working as one. This is exactly what I was talking about in terms of understanding where we can get more aggressive with the material. Not only did we go thinner on the face, but if you look at those two little pictures down on the left side, you can actually see how the leading edge is uh, it's a large area of deflection, a large area of stress and strain when you, when you compact a golf ball. So what that means, if you're a, co a company who's welding a face on, or if you have a multiple piece golf club, because that's a high strain area, you need to have reinforcement in that area. But ultimately, if you want the largest trampoline possible, which you always want to get better, more consistent ball speeds, you want to engage more of the head and the impact. So by doing this in a one-piece chromoly golf club, not welding that face, we can actually utilize the engagement of the sole as well. So it makes the trampoline play larger. And that's something that we did a little bit different is we actually have a variable sole thickness as it transitions from the face to the sole that allowed us to engage that part of the golf club in the impact to get more ball speed. And these are the results. We've, we've had to block the brands out, but essentially <laughs> this is from your robotic testing. So the, the, the image at the top is the hot metal. Um, so you basically measure sensor ball speed and then you measure all around the, the perimeter as well, right? So you're trying to get a almost like a table where you've got a golf club that not just is quick, but is quick from all parts of the club and you're comparing it against everything else, correct? That's right. This is what we call our ball speed retention maps where we'll do a center strike and then we'll do toe heel up and down because how good is a center strike that goes fast if every other strike goes slow? So our whole thing is we, we want to make sure you have the most consistent ball speed across the face. And you can see, while we were first place in the down direction, we were second place in everything else. So I'm not sitting here saying we're the fastest everywhere on the face, which a lot of our competitors feel like they scream that all the time. Uh, we lost the center ball speed by 0.1 miles per hour. But then if you look at the overall consistency, we were the most consistent of anybody. Some companies are really good low. Some companies are really good high. Some really good on the toe. Some really good on the heel. We want to maximize all of those. Have you seen that over the years, Ian, where you've had a golf club that's been a, a great performer at one particular <clears throat> thing that's maybe been let down in one particular area or without yeah, naming yeah, brands or models? When, when we went to, to start working with GC Quad, that was one of the things that was really easy to see. So when you can map the strikes all over the face and you see certain um, patterns with players, you can then go, okay, well, he, he's, you know, maybe he's a little bit shallower, the long irons, and, and kind of the strike moves down the face a little bit, adding a little bit of dynamic loft and a little shallow, so the strike moves down. So there are heads that deal with that better than others. And, and I think as te launch monitor technology has improved, it's, allowed us to understand the heads a little bit better and which ones we can select that are going to do a better job in the moment. So this is, this is pretty cool to see that it's, it's performing so well all across the face. Obviously, proof, proof will be in the, uh, the final outcomes when it, we, won't, you know, we don't get to decide that, the public do, and, and, you, and just people like yourselves will sit and work with it on a daily basis. And again, Chris, I know you'll be particularly proud of how it looks rather than just how it performs. Yeah, again, very, very sleek, very modern look. Um, there's a 
load of forgiveness built into golf clubs that still look beautiful in the bag. And that that's where Mizuno, to me, that's one of my most proud things is if you want to design a golf club to only care about engineering specs and to only care about is the COR this or is the MOI this, whatever, we could do that. But to be able to do it in a beautiful package, that takes some true talent and some true art bringing that in. And, and again, I, I know you're not just giving yourself that praise. So there's a whole no, team no. in Japan and America that work on this together, right? Though, you, though you've tended to be the face of the operation, there's a, there's a lot of other art designers and R&D guys behind the scenes in both countries. I'm speaking for uh, the most talented team of engineers and designers ever. I mean, we have so many engineers. I mean, we got David, we got John. I'm just thinking right back behind here. We got Kazu, we got Cooper, we got Nobu. We got so many different guys who are doing amazing things for these irons to make them look absolutely beautiful and perform incredibly. And that's like, we've got, we've got members from uh, that started in Japan that have come to work in America. I know Dave, David spends a lot of time back and forth as to Japan as, as yourself have done as well. It, and it sounds a little bit cliche, but it's genuinely a collaboration between both countries, right? A hundred percent. And particularly in a JPX line because JPX is a brand that started in Japan and then we've kind of, adopted it to the western world and now it truly is a global product and we're excited about that because japan has seen some of the success we've had and it's actually evolved to be a, a an international product a lot more so than it's ever been before uh, specs again so both the pro and the normal hot metal identical in terms of uh, loft and lie and length all those all those things chris that's right. So this one is um, us on the stronger side of the world. However, we're still not nearly as strong as a lot of our competitors. We play the we play the loft game because we because we have to, not because we want to. But this golf club launches tremendously high, a much lower speed spot than the previous version, and it just it performs. So it's a distance golf club that'll go up against anything. One thing that's cool I want to point out on some of these stock, stock specs and the shafts and grips, some new additions to our lineup. The NS, NS Pro 950 Neo is a new addition to our line. That's going to come in the Hot Metal. And in the Hot Metal Pro, actually, a Project X LZ Blackout. So a really cool blacked out version for that entire golf club. So the, the, pro, the pro is very blacked out, and the standard is very chromed out. Really great looking clubs. And I know everyone's now, we're at a point we've used a lot of everyone's time up. The map has just changed just slightly. So having the Hot Metal and the Hot Metal Pro coming at the same year, you've just mm -hmm. recalibrated a little bit? Yeah, that's right. So because the Hot Metal Pro came last, last time, we almost designed it where the forge fit directly between the two and the Hot Metal. This time by launching them all at once, it gave the Forge a little bit room to get smaller and the Hot Metal Pro to get a touch larger. So in terms of the head size, you can see a nice separation between them, but the biggest change in it was the Forge getting smaller. Uh, I mean, that literally pretty much wraps everything up, Chris. So just, to, I mean, I'd, I'd like just to get Ian, like, because Ian's going to be out there working with these products on a daily basis. What do you take from the whole thing, Ian? What, what are you looking forward to finding out? I just think those two heads in the middle, when I, when I saw the, the Forge and I saw the Hot Metal Pro, and I just think of the size of the market that fits into those two, those are the ones that really excite me. You know, I love, I love the, the kind of the blend, the progression through the lines, but I just know the amount of players that are going to be attracted into those two. When we done the test with Donovan, <clears throat> the sound of that chromoly was so soft. I mean, it was, it was incredible to, uh, he played another brand and he was in a distance iron. And, you know, the first thing he said is, is, you know, this is, this is the softest feeling iron, you know, I've ever hit. And, uh, and he was in the pro, he was in the hot metal pro. It was just the, the sound of it is it, it kind of makes you feel like you're in a, you know, an MP, a traditional blade where you get that feedback. So um, I think a lot of people who have always wanted that from their irons, can now have it in a head that helps them with the performance and, and we can get the data we want. Fred, any, any takeouts for you? You'll, you'll be testing soon as well. Anything you're particularly looking forward to? Yeah, obviously the wedges that you guys didn't tell me about. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the wedges for sure. And I mean, anything that Misuna comes out with is going to be good. So uh, 
I'm super excited to see if uh, if I'm going to be changing irons there soon or not. <laughs> okay, well, Chris, thank you very much for your time. I know everybody loves to hear from you because you're kind of the, the authoritative word on Mizuno. So I think it's great for people to get this kind of extended look at everything. So thank you very much for that. I apologise to the world yeah. for my headphones. I'm not used to being in front of camera and I'm, I need to be much cooler like Fred and Ian. Ian, <laughs> all, right. the best, all the best with the studio, the new building. You must be thank excited you, about man. that. Yeah, really excited. It's been a long time coming. Obviously, we, we planned and having it open early March and uh, with everything that was pushed back. So um, the, the kind of swell and, and interest in bookings, the second store is really going to help with that. And to be honest, the amount of our US customers who can't travel, that's kind of pushing us to do our first US store probably in the fall. So um, we're, we're starting to get to move things pretty quick. Well, best of luck with that. And Fred, Thanks. best of luck. Hope, hope, hope you manage to get out some tournaments and get yourself back to America in the not too distant future. Yeah, we'll see. There are a few tournaments here I can play in Sweden and then uh, I'll be back soon. Okay. Best of luck, everyone. Thanks Thanks for joining us. Chris, we'll, we'll probably do an Instagram Live or something a few weeks down the line, just with you this time. And we'll, we'll, we'll get some more questions from people if we can, uh, we can look forward to that. That's awesome. Well, thank everybody for coming on. This was I felt like this was hopefully informative for everybody and a definitely a different uh, different approach to uh, showing off some new product.